couple programming notes. I uh, don't have video, um, and neither will Eric, who follows me. Oh, okay. And there might be an echo on this. Yes. And I apologize if, for that. If you if you open both the online the, the audio and the, the phone audio, you will get the echo. So you only use one of them. Okay. Well, I don't know how to. We'll have to see if we can. Yeah. Just mute the audio on the Zoom app if you use the call in. Oh. Uh, on the left hand side of the the menu. Oh. Uh, there's a mute and the work is nerd is also a disconnect audio. Oh, audio setting. Oh, right. Okay. Uh, I think it's okay now. Okay. Is that better? Yes. Okay. Great. Uh, welcome everyone. Happy, challenging Saturday. Um, let me see. Ken, you can flip to the next chart or my chart. Your chart. We don't okay. need to see my face again. Okay. Yeah. Uh, this is um, an expanded set of charts from last Saturday, and I'm honored to do this again. Um, and and. As Sakar might have mentioned, we're always looking for other speakers to help with these town halls. Um, I want to start off talking a little bit about myself and some of the networking that I've been able to do, which includes the esteemed colleague that follows me, Eric, from our work at Raytheon. And then we're going to talk about a fair amount about resumes. We could easily go over an hour and then some job leads, some interview techniques, STEM outreach activities, which some of you might be interested in while you're at home. And then uh, my contact information. And I do have my slides numbered as does Eric, so we can keep track of things. And one other programming note, if you wanna send questions to uh, on the chat room, Ken will interrupt me when those questions come in. Okay, next chart, Ken. Um, my degrees are up there. I have uh, had different uh, current have top secret clearance. Um, those clearances are taking longer than uh, before, even before the virus uh, stop was going on. I mostly, in, as many other people are in AAA, in the aerospace defense industry, um, I've had the pleasure of working for the companies shown on there, currently a Raytheon, uh, and for those that may be somewhat new to the industry, uh, original equipment manufacturers is what we're talking about on the top part of that, and then systems engineering and technical assessment are the kind of, uh, work that's done, for example, at our uh, Space and Missile Center Air Force contractor at the LA Air Force Base. And there are uh, lots of contractors that support the blue suitors there. And by the way, um, some of those companies are hiring. I've also worked for some pre-IPO companies, smaller companies in the area, and then have also done both um, direct and contract work and there is lots of headhunter agencies out there that are pursuing what they, uh-oh, we lost again. Jeez. Are we back? But can you hear me, Ken? Yeah, yes, you, you, you're okay. always on. Sorry. No, no, I, we, no, no. So the last time I lost audio when we lost the video, sorry. No, it's okay, um, no, no problem. Thank you, thank you. Lots of the agencies are doing what they call contract to hire, where they go to three to six months uh, to help companies with surges, and then potentially you can go direct. Uh, there are um, 1099 versus W-2, 
uh, ways of uh, uh, acquiring that that are beyond this discussion, but that is something that people need to keep in mind. Uh, and then I've also had the pleasure of continuing education. There are um, many local vendors that are identified there that do seminars. Um, a lot of those before the virus included lunch at their all local office. Um, and with the right coordination, some of those same vendors could be doing some online seminars even in this forum, and they continue to do that during the week. Um, Raytheon has after-hours classes uh, called ATEP uh, that uh, are running. Lots of companies have that, and then we also have, as other companies have, lunch and learn seminars that are ongoing. So continuing education is real important, and hopefully people can um, connect into that and leverage that. Next slide, Ken. Um, on chart three, there are many ways to continue networking and in our uh, challenged sequestered environment, uh, this is a good way to continue this even online. Uh, I am obviously currently presenting to the AAA there is also equally active in COSI, which is a fancy acronym for the International Council of System Engineering uh, that has an LA chapter. I actually, as you see, have a double E background, so IEEE is also active. And in fact, all three of those have monthly um, board planning meetings that you are welcome to uh, join. And of course, they've been all going online of late. Um, there are other societies around. I'm going to plug the Planetary Society, which was formed by the Honorable late Carl Sagan. Their headquarters is now at a fancy bank building up in Pasadena. And it's through the networking at Planetary Society that I got my JPL speaker that's been speaking on the Curiosity rover at the uh, Mars Rover Expo that I do that will be mentioned later. I also happen to be involved in a couple sports leagues, one of which is at Raytheon because they have beautiful fields there. I do some church stuff that's mentioned on there. I've also been involved in some YP activities and STEM outreach stuff, which I will describe a little further later. Obviously, many of those aforementioned societies are very interested in getting and keeping younger members as, partly as volunteers and also paid because that helps their budget. Um, then I'm also involved in several organizations at Raytheon uh, through which I also met Eric, who's the follow-on speaker. They have uh, TIGs to keep track of different technology areas. For example, Raytheon is very big in electro-optical technology and radar technology. Um, and those, what those TIGs are for, they have ERG that support other and, and the, the, new, the new employees coming on board, and then those lunch and learn from four. And you can proceed to chart four, sir. Until one retires to that Tahiti condo, a resume hopefully is something that should be a living document. And in this time of being at home would be a wonderful opportunity to dust off that resume and keep it updated. Because if you post your resume online, you will never know when your phone will ring with a job lead. Uh, these days, a lot of those leads are coming by a text. Um, Resume needs to be targeted to the type of job you're going after, not necessarily a specific job, but at least the type of job, and we'll talk a little more about that later, in terms of, and should highlight some of the technical skills that you have, and I'm highlighting kind of the cradle to grave that's common in a lot of industries, including aerospace. You're starting out with a customer providing a RFP, a request for proposal, you, the company submits a proposal. There's both cost and schedule. You go through a design phase 
uh, in a lot of places that's called EMD, uh, engineering model development, prototyping, INT, integration test, and sell-off of that product or service. Computer tools are mentioned there, again, somewhat to my slightly biased double E background. There are scads of those out there. And then the soft skills are also very important. Being able to interface with people, uh, conduct briefings, planning for and executing briefings, um, doing uh, vendor coordination, because lots of companies are subcontracting out items or services. Uh, IPTs are fairly common in aerospace. Um, again, different people coming in in different air departments or areas of the company and working together. That's the buzzword there is IPT. The resume should have a fair amount of white space. And I've had the pleasure of talking to and working with several recent grads, early career people that are cram trying to cram all their stuff on one page. Those tend to go in the file 13, not circulatable thing. So white space is important. Uh, reverse chronological is pretty standard, having the most recent education and experience first. And the top half of the first page has to motivate the reader to continue reading. The top of the fold, if they call it in the newspaper industry. So that's also something that you see on the resume. Ken, you can go to the next page, please. The resume needs to have a easy, not too long, file name because HR and managers have lots of them in their folders inbox. I have an example there. Uh, notice it includes, as, as with many important things in many industries, configuration management, being able to track what version that you're using. That's what the XX is for. Um, ease of availability, um, as, you, as you may know, there is a narrow margin option on Word under layout that you can use to cram a little more info on the page. And then if you have re reasonable experience or some related summer internship, going to more than one page is not sacrilegious, is, not, is, is, is okay. And that would depend, uh, again, on the extent of the, air, uh, the experience and the education that one has. Uh, next page, please. The resume is still a text document, although I have seen a few students put OCRs on their resume, which have, heaven knows what HR would do with that. So we want to keep it away from graphics, mostly text, because these things are ingested into ATSs, and they, I don't think they do very well if there's a lot of non-textual stuff in them. Um, bulleted format with keywords, several of which are shown there. It's obviously not an English paper, so there's not complete sentences, but action verbs are part of each of those bullets. Uh, I recommend Arial font 12, decent, readable, good size font. Uh, if you're playing your experience or education trump card, for those that like bridge, experience first, then that is what you put on your resume and the top half of that fold. Half to under skills, and we'll talk about the format shortly. Ken, next slide, please. The profile section is the most important thing under your contact information, and I'll show you mine shortly. And lots of people skip it. One has to be able to quickly zero in the reader on what kind of job, what kind of background you have, what kind of degrees you have, and what level of experience you have 
going into the reading the resume. The profile should be only three or four lines. Um, and it's summary, it's essentially the summary of your 30 second elevator pitch, which would be greatly leveraged at job fairs, which are still ongoing before the virus. So that, that profile and that elevator pitch should be the same. And we'll talk more about that on the next page. Next chart, Ken. Sorry. The profile section should capture right up front one of these four keywords. Nearly graduated, early, entry level, first job out of school essentially, first professional job, uh, early career or experience. Definitely setting the reader's tone as to uh, how much of a, a veteran, shall we say, is coming into this. Uh, you want to highlight some keywords. I have several mentioned there. Um, I would highly recommend, if you know of or have worked in anything that's embedded, everything these days is embedded. All this Internet of Things, smart devices, if you've had a chance to work at that, that's a, a good keyword to put in there, as long as you understand what it means. Cyber is obviously also huge these days. Uh, IT is information technology. No company would exist without their IT department, especially when we're working off-site. Um, latest formal degree should be mentioned in a profile. And then, as it mentioned at the bottom there, what, experience, what industry experiences you have. Notice there are commercial aerospace companies out there that are doing commercial electronics as it might be ruggedized into a commercial application, uh, aerospace application. Power industry, there, we are very fortunate in the city of Angels to have many industries uh, somewhat locally. Uh, at the bottom there, FFRDCs are federally funded research and development corporations. One very well known in the area is Aerospace Corporation um, that support government customers such as the Space and Missile Center that I mentioned previously in El Segundo. Not too long ago, the medical industry would be a highly biomedical be highly tantalizing field to go into because lots of people are getting older in the last month or so those people are more on the front line than they probably realize next chart again the profile should also indicate any management experience that one had because lots of companies would like to groom younger employees to get into management slots, starting with section managers, going up to department managers, going up to center managers, per Raytheon. Um, U.S. citizenship or visa equivalent is also very important. If you reference the security clearance, you've already taken care of that. Otherwise, that needs to be on the resume somewhere and it would be nice to reference it up front. Um, and I don't understand the different types of visas. A lot of companies will put in their ads that they do not do sponsorships. Um, so one has to be able to, uh, and, and on the interview, if you have a visa, you need to explain the status of that and where you're going with it. I already mentioned security clearances. Um, the, the previous speaker, um, this is the levels of security clearance that she was alluding to before. The um, SAP, is Special Access Programs, are all those highly classified SCIF programs behind closed doors that um, are very envious to have those tickets. Uh, some of those clearances require polygraphs, but new hires would start out at confidential and work their way up. Um, secrets are 
generally good for 10 years. She had, top secret is like five. Any certifications that one has, um, for those that are still in school, if you are referenced to take your EIT, that would be a very tempting thing to do while you're young and have all this background information that they tackle. And that leads to a professional engineering PE degree, which you need in various structural and uh, utilities industries that's uh, state-based, like the medical equivalents, and needs to be renewed every so often, and also requires some continued education, but it's another good thing to have on the resume. Obviously, IT certs are huge these days. Anything from Cisco and bill related stuff is awesome. I had the pleasure of talking to a person whose resume and his education originated in the Middle East. And I didn't know what gender I was talking to on the phone. So, um, maybe um, clarifying your name on the resume would be something to keep in mind if you have a challenging name because many companies, including Raytheon, are very much attuned to and hiring for diversity candidates. Next slide, Ken. Under profile, as you'll see on mine shortly, you want to bulletize skills, starting with your, where you have experience in the cradle to grave, the stuff that I talked about. A lot of you in school or out of school have done some modeling, now like the P-Spice or MATLAB. Very good stuff to highlight on there. Um, P, other PC tools, everybody knows Bill Gates real well, so Microsoft Office should be identified. Um, Doors is a classic requirements flow down tool that has been bought by IBM, so clearly they're around. Requirements flow down for determining uh, and baselining requirements for a system. MATLAB is a very well-known tool that covers many different industries. LabVIEW is a test software automation tool that helps you um, baseline and run a, a whole slew of test equipment in the lab. And that's done by National Instrument that also does local seminars. The rest of, there's lots of other mechanical tools out there. Being able to write and express oneself in documents that are shared with others internally and externally is very important. So any technical writing that one has done is good to note on the, on the skill set. And I would also advise to have hard copies of that, if possible, sanitized that you could bring as part of a portfolio to an interview to uh, emphasize the resume when you get to that point. Again, lots of companies are doing uh, subcontract, so working with vendors, um, RFQs, requests for quotes, requests for proposals, um, statement of works, SOW is a very key contractual document that tells a contractor the scope, the cost, and the schedule of the work that's being proposed as part of an RFP or a proposal. Cedrals are contract data requirements list that is a French way of saying documents that the uh, subcontractor is expected to deliver to the prime during the course of the contract. Those could be technical um, specs, reports, uh, program management, uh, cost and schedule, deliverables, et cetera. 
And then the soft skills that's mentioned at the bottom there. If you were part, if you were leading a senior project, that's an excellent thing to reference on that part of the resume or other IPT related stuff. Next chart, sir. If, em if employment is your uh, top uh, benefit you're bringing to the company, that should be under skills for each employer, full name and location, whether it was direct or contract, that particularly applies if the employment was not very long. Um, if it was a former employer, it would be a good idea to indicate a little something as to why the separation occurred. Voluntary is certainly okay. Layoff is certainly okay. Again, um, some of us have somewhat nomad looking resumes and that's a good way to uh, help document that. Titles are important, not necessarily what the company said, but what you're doing for the company. And if you've been at the company a while, uh, hopefully showing a progression of title during that time. It, the, for each employer, it would be good in it, right under the name one or two lines to indicate what that employer does or produces or services made at that location and how you, your work uh, aligned with that, that product or service. Because there's lots of companies out there and not everybody knows all that. And then obviously how your role related to the project you're on to what the company makes. Next chart, Ken. And more, most importantly, what you've done with that title for that employer. Action verbs, as shown there, are important. Try to use a variety of them and target what you were doing. Uh, generated uh, uh, analysis, um, networked with vendors, baselined some requirements, for example, obtained an RFQ from a vendor, all good things to summarize and have handy if you have handouts. In, in addition to what you did, if, you, if that could be quantified, and for those of us that are not business it's a little tough sometimes to quantify things, but I have some examples there. Analyzing parameters for a MATLAB routine, um, obtained quotes, track a certain number of requirements or specs. Numbers are a good thing to have. That seems to be in vogue these days. Again, showing the progressively higher titles if you've been with the company a while. And going past employers, the general guideline is 10 years, unless you've done different types of work that might apply to the same uh, employer that you're applying to, in which case you might want to go back further. Uh, next slide. Dan, if we have any questions, please interrupt me. Uh, degree need to be listed formally and spelled out, reverse chronological. Uh, I would only think your last two would be important because as I showed you, the progression of degrees requires predecessors. So you don't need to go back too far. Um, institution and location per degree. If your GPA was good and or your recent grad, you could note that. For those of us that been around a while, you can obviously skip that. For each degree, certainly note what your degree specially was. I have several identified there. 
not in a, not in an extensive list. But more importantly, you also want to show some of your senior level electives and labs, some of which you chose, some of which enhance your degree, others of which expand your degree. And you want to list those, and I'll have some examples of that later. Relevant technologies and tools and test equipment. I have several examples there. RF is radio frequency. In this uh, internet connected world, a lot of people think and assume the RF is magic, but radio frequency is how things communicate into the digital world. And that's still very important and very stressing as we go into 5G. We'll need to have more towers to support the higher frequencies and data rates that everybody wants, FYI. Uh, oscilloscopes, power supplies, multimeters are all fairly standard in labs. Again, doubly focused. Um, breadboarding stuff, um, simulating stuff is all ways of leveraging technology to see if it's ready enough to go be built and flying. Outside activities in college or after college, dynamite stuff. Uh, AIAA, for example, has a is very active chapter connection locally at Cal State Long Beach. And I've presented there. They have speakers coming in talk. They are very active president, vice president, secretaries. Excellent things to include on your resume, network with, and expand your horizon. Some of those uh, chapter presidents at the colleges show up at our AAA board meeting, FYI. Excellent way to network into the industry that you're interested in getting into. Right question. Next whenever chart, Ken. Is it questions? Yes, sir. Uh, a couple questions here uh, for me. Uh, I've been, you know, advising some folks who are in the mechanical engineering world that are trying to re-enter their own business industry. And on the skills, I've been trying to suggest to them that even though they're mechanical engineering, that they consider getting much better engineering skills, just B plus plus and so forth. Some of them may be hesitant because they think that, oh, I'm a mechanical. What do I want to do with that? Do you have any thoughts on that on expanding beyond your core competency to adjacent engineering such as software development and so forth? At the uh, uh, bolster your um, thank you. I there was other interference, I didn't catch all of that. Um, could you put that summarize in the chat box that Ken could uh, well, uh, I'll just say real quick you know, would it help for mechanical and aerospace engineers to learn software development skills such as C and C, even though they're not programmers, just to help them be more marketable and more useful as mechanical yes. engineers? And things are Heaven, yes. Yes, yes, sir. I, I, it, software languages permeate lots of industries, yes. C, C, Python, um, Java are all, and I. I Eric will probably expand on that a little bit later. Yes, that's all good things to have. Software hey, Eric. runs the world. Oh, Eric, go ahead. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, my background's in chip design, and you have to know how to write software just because you get gigabytes of results that you need to parse through and figure out what's really going on and generate graphs. You have to be able to know how to write really big uh, scripts to run all, to run all of your jobs together to collect all your data so it used to be you know typing was what something that everybody needed and now have some some understanding of programming is something that everybody needs thanks eric yeah sir i my contact information you want to follow up later i appreciate that but yes software runs the world it makes all these chips smart which makes all this embedded stuff happen including your phone and your car. So yes, software is definitely something to, and, and a lot of the modeling that I mentioned in some of those tools is all software based. 
and, and this is not just for double E. This is for aero and mechanical guys as well. Right. right? Yeah. So I'm understand. Oh I, yeah. And and again, there's a lot of synergy between all these. The the mechanical cars are getting smarter because of what's inside the cars. I understand. Next chart, Ken. So, humbly speaking, here is the top part of yours truly's resume. And I do not mean to brag, but I want to give you an idea of the white space. Notice early on how it's pleasing to the eye. Notice it has the sections that we talked about, but I want to start at the top. Notice the name and the short name. For those that have longer names or stuff that may be difficult to pronounce, highly encourage adopting or using a surname. When you get on an interview or on the phone, because lots of companies start with a phone screen or a Skype, you don't want the potential manager to be stumbling over a long name or a mispronounced name. An example there. Address is not needed. Current home location, city is perfectly fine. The two most important things underneath that are a reliable phone number and an email address. If they're interested in talking, either HR or a hiring manager, they will call. It is most important to have a clear voicemail that indicates to the caller either a phone number or a name of the person they're calling to verify they called the right place. So having background music on that phone is not a good idea. Obviously, an email address that's not horribly long, again, if you're using your name and that's rather long, you might consider shortening that because Somebody has to type that in at one point, and we don't want any misspellings if possible. Hotmail is one of the older services out there, but a lot of people still use them. So notice the contact information is also each on a single line, because the ATS, when they ingest this, some people try and save space by doubling up on that stuff at the top of the resume. That is not a good idea. Notice that it's all most important stuff at the top. If for those of you that are so inclined, want to include your LinkedIn link URL under that header information, that's certainly okay. Then the profile, notice um, using the keywords that I spent time talking about before, Highlighting the advanced degree or the latest degree, the highest clearance, some of the industries that I've been involved in, um, payload avionics. Avionics, by the way, is aviation electronics, which is how all the planes fly, and very soon how cars are going to get smarter if they're not already. So that's mentioned on there, again, giving the reader a good idea of the background. And, and the level of experience. The skills, again, shown on there. Notice, I've had the pleasure, since I've been around a while, cradle to grave, notice that's mentioned on there. Um, I, I will add, the certification is very important in industries like aerospace, where you're certifying an airplane to fly for the FAA. There are lots of certification hurdles that are required. Similar, I'm assuming, in other industries, for example, utilities, when they turn on or return on a power plant. There, there's lots of certification and government um, activities and audits associated with that. Fred, there's an unanswered uh, question in the Q&A window. I don't know if you saw that. Someone else asked uh, No, can, can you... Um... Sorry. I could read the question. It says, what are the restrictions for dual citizens entering uh, aerospace and defense? Should dual citizenship be listed in one's resume? You know, you know 
I, I again, I'm not an expert on that. Um, however, dual citizenship is very key item in security clearance questions with regard to not only do you have such, but do you have immediate family or relative in that uh, dual citizen? So because of the association with and the dual responsibilities one has with that kind of dual activity. Um, getting clearances could be a challenge, depending on where the other half of the duel comes from. Obviously, the Middle East would be questionable. So yeah, that would have to be looked at. Um, I, I had the pleasure of knowing, actually, the, the current president of the, a, a SWE, uh, the Society of Women Engineers LA chapter, we were at a uh, resume workshop career thing together, and she confessed that she removed her dual citizenship to work at the current aerospace company she was at. So that has to be looked at very seriously, especially in the more challenging world environment that we have for getting the virus. So um, she had to disown and only become a US citizen, at least to get a clearance at her company. I hope that partially answers the question. Proceeding on, since I've been around a while, the experience is the next thing that one lists, and you will notice uh, the Raytheon reference, the um, title and responsibility and some of the things that I've done. Uh, Eric was mentioning uh, smart chips, application-specific integrated circuits, ASICs, are costly but very important in a lots of smart devices. The related cheaper and faster things are called field programmable gate arrays, FPGAs, which also makes things smart. And I noticed the keywords under the experience, some of the numbers that are mentioned there, again, following up with what I talked about earlier. And notice I even read some of the tools. Uh, at, um, ST, for the newer people on the phone, STE, ATE are special test equipment, automated test equipment, which, and again, for a lot of you that are getting into the industry, getting into testing and seeing where the rubber meets the road in terms of designs actually going into manufacturing, or at least first article production, uh, STEs and ATEs are the setups they use in the labs to do test checkouts. And again, LabVIEW is a key tool that helps drive those test racks. So those are important things. Uh, circuit card assemblies, CCAs, or w, uh, PWBs, circuit card assemblies, printed wiring boards, are the, the circuit boards, electronic circuit boards that the chips go on, of which one is in your phone. Um, EMI, EMC, electromagnetic interference compatibility is very important with regard to making sure that a new box, for example, on a car or a plane doesn't interfere with other boxes on the plane or the car um, because we, want, we don't want the control system on the plane or the car interfered with with the new box. So this is all important stuff. Next uh, chart, Ken. Here is a education section for those that are using education and I'll, this is my teaching part of my education, but I put this on here to show some of those senior projects for the newly graduated or soon to be graduated stuff. I had the pleasure of teaching at ITT. I groomed some of the techs to work at some of the companies I worked at and enhanced some of that curriculum. They 
unfortunately, were shut, forced to shut down a couple of years ago, and I previously worked at DeVry. Um, notice I mentioned PC-based tools that you used in the lab. Again, apologize, this is electronics-focused. Hopefully, the mechanicals and, and other aerospace have other tools that they use that they can cite on here. Um, notice I'm hiding the higher level classes and also some of the technologies used in those classes. And if you had a senior project, I would definitely cite that. Hopefully you have a hard copy of your senior project. You could bring with you to an interview and you could talk about what that senior project was, uh, what was produced, uh, what were the results etc. Um, PLCs, programmable logic controllers, run a lot of the automation, for example, at Disneyland, because my older daughter works there in Imagineering, for example, of another part of technology. ADC, analog to digital converters and digital to analog converters, is how we go from the analog world to the digital world which is obviously important in lots of areas. Um, RAM and ROM should be pretty straightforward. Uh, uh, integrated development environments, IDE is how you develop and program new chips and new boards that you're developing. TCP IP is what runs all the internet stuff that we talk across these days. Uh, internet protocol. IEEE 802 is the networking standards that are used for all the networking stuff that we use, and I including Bluetooth. Virtual LANs, these virtual pri private networks, is how we communicate at home, VPN, without getting too much into IT stuff. Uh, Ken, next chart. My education is shown here. Again, the degrees. And the specialties thereof, and then the continuing education. There's um, MB model based system engineering is getting very huge, and com uh, societies like Encozy are very big on MBSE, for example. SystemL is another tool. Eric may talk about that a little more later. Uh, ISR at the bottom. Intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance is how we found bin Laden and where a lot of the highly classified stuff that companies work on comes from. Uh, next chart, Ken. The bottom of the resume is where you can put, and again, if it goes over one page, it's fine, some other emphasis of things that you talked about earlier, recapping in separate categories. Starting with, and very important somewhere, if your future job might rely on it, hands-on activities. This doesn't just have to be hardware, it could also be software. I've mentioned several things up there. Um, bit array testers is a very key item in checking out digital technologies. Um, ATE and STE, I mentioned before, spectrum analyzers analyze things in the frequency domain where digital sampling oscilloscopes, DSOs, are looking at things in the time domain. Very important. Analysis tools. I've taken a little liberty under publications. For those of you that have PhDs, or masters with thesis, definitely target those publications and repeat them here, along with other documents that you can lay claim to, have authored, and have maybe have samples of at the interview. ICDs are interface control documents that are very important with regard to how you describe and baseline interfaces between existing and new boxes that you may be putting in a plane or an aircraft or a home office. 
notice uh, there's unit specs, subsystem specs, payload specs, different levels of integration mentioned there. There can be technical publications, business publications, all mentioned there. Affiliations are fairly obvious uh, with regard to some of the societies. I've mentioned several. ASME, the, for the mechanical, is very important. They have come to my Mars rover in the past. Uh, a, a, uh, ASCE, for the civil engineers, there is a structural organization out around, very important with regard to our shaking Los Angeles. Um, AICHE, I've had the pleasure of recently connecting with the chemical engineering um, and other related fields and other related non-aerospace uh, non stuff. Uh, volunteer work is certainly very important. I'm gonna expand on some of my stuff here shortly. Um, everybody hopefully here knows what STEM is. Um, as you see, I've been, had the pleasure of liaisoning between many societies, which is a key part of this expo, and then doing some other sports stuff on the side. Again, at the bottom, before you leave the resume, any hobbies that are related to your field, electronics, Radio Shack, Heath Kits, which are unfortunately mostly in the Smithsonian, uh, other hobbies that you do that are related to your career. When you have lunch with your potential manager during an on-site interview, that manager is going to pick on some of those things you put at the bottom of the resume with regard to hobbies. Photography, sports, church, etc. Somewhere on this resume, you need to indicate, again, the citizenship. That could be at the bottom under miscellaneous, along with maybe a diversity comment, if needed. Notice the higher level poly is mentioned on there from the past for the SAP stop. Next chart, Ken. Fred, a quick question for you, if I may, whenever sure. you're ready. Sure, sure, uh, sorry. Part of the uh, professional level or company-sponsored education, this is a specific question, but just, just to kind of highlight this as an example. Uh, when I, before I joined Raytheon years ago, uh, they had the Simpson book, which was a book that was turned into a book about gas, was offered by Hugh as the reverse thought, of course, how radar actually works in the real world. And uh, my question is, are they still doing that? And uh, any thoughts on those type of classes that you cannot go to a university that can only be offered in the value of those, that's of those type of Yeah. Um, I appreciate the question. However, the echoing and the interference, could we um, summarize the key words of that question? Yes. Uh, Stimson book, are you familiar with it? That's the uh, fundamentals of radar, uh, airborne radar book that Hughes okay. into a book, an uh, example of a class that Hughes created because no university taught it. Any, any what if, thoughts on such value of such type of courses? I would definitely list those under, list those under continuing education. What else was being asked about are that? They still, are they still uh, doing that class at Raytheon? Oh. Eric and I haven't been there long enough to determine that, but we, we certainly have a lot of huge legacy stuff around. And I can assure you the big companies have equivalent, yes. And they're taught by experts in the field. Uh, Jeff Puchel, who is a veteran AIAA guy, is a is a remote sensing expert who's talked uh, here before, and he taught a class. I was one of his favorite students. Yes, that stuff is still around. Yes, the the, the powerpoints are still around. Whether the book is, I don't know. Yeah, Do we have any other questions on the resume? Was there a follow up? Okay. Well, I just said the book is still around. It's on Amazon. Oh, okay. Yeah, sure. The technology is exists and 
highly fertile at Raytheon and Northrop. Job leads. I think I'm probably running close on time. There are many job boards out there listed. When you update your resume and or have me look at it, you want to post it on some of these job boards because that's how the agencies and even at companies, uh, the talent acquisition department is fishing online to find you. The resume is how they're going to find you. So making sure that you're listed on there. Um, job aggregators is a easier way for current recs to find you because you can set up a job agent with certain titles and location prefer preferences and have them send to you. Indeed is one of the better ones and you could spend easily half a day responding to Indeed emails with these job agents on them. And they will pull the current recs from companies and put them in a capture a little inbox that you can go through and apply directly to the company on their website. And therefore, it would be ha it would be behoove you to have an updated resume on Indeed to apply to those companies. Obviously, LinkedIn is huge with regard to networking. If you're looking at a particular company and want to get inside, LinkedIn is certainly a way to do that. You may have to pay a, a membership fee for that, but certainly also posting a resume on there is also of great interest. Next chart, Ken. I'm only doing partial justice on an interview, but since we're on a career role here, and for the honorable younger people on the phone, uh, pre-checking out the company that you're going to be interviewing for is certainly important, and what they make, and how your great educational experience ties into that. Uh, reviewing the actual requisition, and obviously, even on a Skype, Uh, dress shirt and tie and a nice blouse for the ladies is still standard even on a video interview. You don't have to have shine shoes, but you have to have, the, like the resume, the top half has to look nice. Um, checking the video connections, if you're doing a video chat, and lots of companies are going to video chat, is obviously very important. And hopefully, the HR person that's pre-coordinating the interview will help you double-check your IT before the main event. I mentioned several times a portfolio that you're developing. Having samples of that at an interview, or maybe flashing them up in front of your camera would be nice. Making sure that there is time for, and you have prepared questions to the interviewer, or a lot of times it's a panel, questions that indicates your interest in the company and the job. The length of the contract that they currently have. Lots of companies are under contract to a government agency, a state agency, etc. And that contract doesn't last forever. Whether that company is what they call prime or a subcontractor is also very important in terms of how far up your job is in the food chain. They're, the prime aerospace companies are currently Lockheed, Raytheon, Northrop, and Boeing. There used to be a lot more, and they've consolidated. Those are what we call the big boys. A lot of companies are sub to the big boys, and lots of companies in the City of Angels are sub to some of those big boys. 
There are prime contractors at the LA Air Force Base working on the technical services, and they have subs. For example, companies that just do Microsoft uh, project schedule stuff, they have special subcontractors that just do the schedules for the LA Air Force Base. By the way, sidebar, the LA Air Force Base is in our backyard, and they oversee the Air Force Space Acquisition for the Global Positioning System, GPS, um, which came out of the, uh, the World War II. Some of your ta defense tax dollars are going to GPS, and the GPS system is obviously currently used and really thought of as utility, which keeps the timing of and in, uh, communication with the, our phones and our cars and everything else that's smart these days. The GPS is an underlying part of that system. And there are teams at SMC that are looking at what they call GPS-3, which is the next generation of that satellite system that we've all assumed to be a utility, which was not in the past. SMC also does the Air Force weather and communications and lots of other things that our, our war fighters need to keep the bad boys at bay. Sorry for the sidebar. The type of tasks you'll be doing at the interview would be certainly of interesting, potentially travel, which is a lot less than it used to be. Business cards, it would be still a good idea to try and get business cards from your interviewers because as you'll see at the bottom, hopefully it's still good etiquette to do a thank you note to those people that you met. Make sure before the final handshake, we will do handshakes again, hopefully soon, that they reemphasize that you want the job and you will also ask them what is the next step in the hiring process. You could also ask them where they are in the hiring process. They could just be started. You could be the first one interviewed, the last one interviewed, and how long that process will take. Obviously, college grads and internships are, are, are targeted for certain spring windows. Fred, a quick and then comment. The thank you note. A question. Actually, just a comment about the dress code. Even though shining your shoes is not required, my observation has been is if your interviewer is prior to military service and you have your shoes shined, that will not go unnoticed by them because they look at it as attention to detail. So even though it's not required, that's something that could actually enhance it if you are being interviewed by a prior military guy. Thank you. Thank you. I, I was referring to the video stuff, not the, uh, not the in real time. No, that, that is true. Thank you. Next page. I'm almost done. Uh, Fred, there Actually, are two questions in the Q&A bar. Uh, Ken, you want to fire a few of those? OK, one is, uh, what's the rule of thumb when using abbreviations in resume? Should the full form be there as well? Uh, sorry. Thank you, Ken. Um, acronyms for uh, the ones that I mentioned are fairly standard. As, as I am biased, in the aerospace industry, if it is not a common industry acronym, that is a very good point. You need to spell it out the first time on the resume, just like in any document. If it is unique to something that you may have done in college that's not necessarily industry vernacular, that I would spell it out. When in doubt, spell it out. But a lot of the acronyms I used are fairly common and indicate that you know some of that vernacular. Obviously, that gets you a leg up and during the interview. Uh, when in doubt, you could ask your society or me if it's aerospace related. Another question, Ken? Yes, under pandemic situation, or interviews are being conducted online now. Please advise how to do a good online interview. 
and the people of no interpersonal interaction could be a problem to know who I'm going to work with. Not to mention is the new job related to relo uh, relocation. It will be hard to check out the location. Well, okay, Let me, thank you. In, in terms of a virtual interview, yes. Um, using some hand gestures, showing um, an active interest in and participation in the interview is important. Uh, as much as, and, and, and hopefully, if you can push for a phone screen first, you can kind of get a sense of things before you do the visual even if the phone screen is with HR or TA, talent acquisition. Um, if you are interested in and able to relocate, yes, relocation, I forgot to mention that, that's a very good point. Relocation is a very definite thing that you want to put on the resume because uh, there are lots of interesting companies and industries outside of LA and also if you're interested in a company and want to get closer to headquarters where a lot of the more interesting stuff goes on including research and development and in aerospace that's called IRAD internal research and development and being at headquarters is has advantages But yes, virtual interviews are going to be a little more challenging and um, we'll need some practice. And, and also, one has to watch time on the interview. Make sure you know whether it's going to be a panel or one-on-one -on -one -on -one, and hopefully some idea of the time allocation because obviously a lot of managers are very busy. Uh, Ken, was there another question? Uh, no, that, that's these two. That's it. Okay. This is my last chart, and I apologize to Eric if I'm running over. We well, still have five minutes. Oh, I'm sorry, second last chart, I think. Yeah. For those that have some time on their hands, this is a good chart to make some notes on if they're interested in helping in the STEM campaign, because clearly more and more people, and particularly diversity people, women, minorities, need to get more interested in and hired in STEM. Again, the companies I work for are very interested in and have STEM specialized fairs. They will take the time to bring in high school and elementary school students to get them interested in STEM. Raytheon does it several times a year, as others do. There are college-based STEM events uh, some of this is pre-virus. Again, I mentioned Cal State Long Beach. Uh, actually, AIAA was very involved in, along with other societies, in a wonderful dinner with industry that they did last year, and we're going to do again, like next weekend, before things got derailed. Excellent opportunity to meet college students in industry. You get a free dinner out of it, and very good networking. Speaker talks, again, other universities have, besides Long Beach, there are active uh, chapters at uh, UCLA and USC, obviously. LA Trade Tech was going to have a College Palooza gig uh, late March that got postponed. Um, all these professional societies I mentioned, including the current one, have, we're having monthly dinner meetings. Again, excellent networking, excellent helping to plan and host and join speakers for meetings. Again, these are online, um, both in COSI and AIAA have theirs a week from Tuesday, next to a week from next Tuesday, second Tuesday, second Tuesday of the month, FYI. Um, IEEE is a week from Monday, by the way. Young professionals, again, societies are very interested in getting new members, volunteers, and 
paid memberships because they get a kickback from national to help their local budget. As I have mentioned before, uh, before the Curiosity, the last Mars rover landed on Mars. And by the way, there's another Mars rover at the Kennedy Space Center that's going to be launched this summer. It's landing next uh, February, believe it or not. We're invading Mars. The Curiosity uh, rover before it landed on Mars, I started an expo to go over that mission and collect societies to network the societies, again, to get the volunteers and the new members and to co-sponsor um, gigs, like maybe this town hall could be co-sponsored in the future, and we're working on that. And the ninth annual was actually penciled in at the Honorable Northrop Grumman S Cafe, and the day down there is still reserved, but questionable whether it will actually be held. So stay tuned for that if that's of interest. Again, um, AIAA showed rockets. Um, there is a British IET society that's brought a Van de Graaff generator, for those that remember their older high school physics classes, generating static electricity, classic stuff, and many other things. Cal State Long Beach, AIAA exhibited there. Great way to network all kinds of things. Um, can go ahead to the next page. <laughs> Through Raytheon, but other companies also, are reaching out to local academic institutions of future higher learning for colleges. Two are noted there, and I've been part of a uh, new employees association at Raytheon that connects to the school. If anybody has time, these are obviously after school weekdays. If anybody has time or is retired and wants to uh, connect with some of this stuff, let me know. Uh, the classes are in hiatus for a while, but when they resume, they always need help, particularly with math. I was tackling some geometry proofs a couple weeks ago at Sarah High, and it was not the most pleasant tutoring I've ever done, but we got through it. The Heritage Center is a mini Smithsonian buried inside the Space and Missile Center at, at, in El, El Segundo that also does high school tours and networks out in the STEM community, as previously mentioned. There's a new um, person that runs that now. And the Heritage Center brought a nice model of a lot of the Air Force satellites to that Mars Rec Expo thing in the past. And they also provided some straw rockets and little uh, mini robots that entertained the younger kids outside the S patio during the Expo JPL talk. Absolutely wonderful. And they have many other STEM gadgets and handouts. Uh, the um, robotic, high school robotics program, first is an acronym for all that. I forget what it stands for, but the R is robotics, is uh, active at several of the local schools, including, for example, West High and Torrance, that also exhibited at the Mars rover, and they had a... Um, three by three foot Mars, uh, I mean, ro uh, robot that was running around the patio shooting basketball. That needs a fair amount of funding because those, uh, the robotic kits they use are several thousand dollars at the high school level. They also have junior high and they also feed the regional competitions were just at Da Vinci, which is across from the Air Force Base, leading to national stuff. So if, that's, if anybody's interested in that, 
a dear colleague of mine at Raytheon happens to be the local contact for that, and they could always use help. From the technical and the program management aspects, if anybody's interested in doing some PM, because they have to schedule all these kids, and they have deadlines. Uh, there are two mentorship organizations that I've had the pleasure of knowing, and they have their names are on there if you'd like to contact them. There are lots of underprivileged kids that are in need of guidance, STEM and otherwise, and uh, one of them is uh, a STEM Advantage program, and I've helped some uh, high school kids or college kids, some of these kids are their first in their family to go to college locally. So if that's of interest, you can drop my name if you want to contact any of those three people at the bottom of that chart or ask me questions later. But there is a great need before the virus to do this kind of stuff. And there is great appreciation for that. So one could network with these people while we're cloistered, if one desires. Next page, Ken. Last but not least, my contact information. Thanks for your time. Um, does anybody have any closing questions before I have the pleasure of introducing Eric? There was a lot of information there. Uh, I believe these charts will be posted on the uh, AIAA website, and you can certainly follow up, and I welcome that. Enjoy the afternoon, and through my Raytheon networking, I have the pleasure of getting to know Eric, who kindly volunteered to follow up. Eric, take over. Uh, wait a second. Uh, uh, Fred, there's a question. Mm -hmm. How important is very long from an EE perspective? No. Oh. Okay. Hi, right, this is Eric. I'm probably better to answer that, just because well, I live Verilog. Um, so in the end, it, after a while, you just wind up with multiple programming languages, you know, kind of whether you're doing C Sharp or C++ or Java, once you've done a couple of them, you, you learn how to do good programming practice or you don't. And Verilog versus VHDL, same kind of situation. Either you practice good engineering practices or you don't. Mill Arrow is generally more VHDL. The commercial world's more Verilog, uh, but that's just you know general statements. <clears throat> uh, is there any further question on that? Uh, sir, uh, on that? Uh, uh, sir, uh, uh, I know what a Verilog VHDL is, but for those who don't know, you might want to explain what what that means. Uh, okay, so Verilog and VHDL are. VHDL will be a, is a strongly typed hardware design language. So think uh, C Sharp or Java or Ada. And Verilog is a loosely typed programming language for hardware. Think uh, C++ or C. <clears throat> so those are the kind of the two different, I guess, for people who don't know them, that's kind of about the simplest way of putting it. Those are hardware description right. languages, right, for specifying electronics, but using a programmatic way of designing and laying out electronics, but the connections, but using it through a programming language? Well, it's, it's, it's not layout. It's just the programming. That's why I said it's, it's just describing the functionality the same as when you write uh, Java, C++, C Sharp, whatever. You know, you're describing the function. And either you practice good programming practices, which is what I'm going to talk about, or you don't, and really that's what makes a difference. Um, I, I don't care, I'll put this way. I can teach anybody anything if they wanna learn, but I can't make, if they don't wanna practice good design practices, uh, if they don't want to learn, if they don't wanna be a team player, I can't fix that. Uh, I'm not gonna hire them. And that's what I interview for, is not whether or not you know Verilog or not, but whether you want to learn. When I was in college, uh, back in the uh, late 70s to the 80s, I was told in engineering school, half of what we teach you will be obsolete in four years. All we can do is teach you how to absorb new information and learn from it and how to work together. 
towards a solution. That's all we can really teach you. And things have not gotten slower. So what I'm looking for when I interview again is somebody who knows how to work together with people, who wants to learn, because the one thing I'm going to be sure of is that in four years, whatever I interviewed for won't, technically won't matter. Eric, there's a, a follow-up question. Is Verilog a good elective for double E's? Uh, Verilog or VHDL. The problem is that Verilog is a loosely typed language, so it's very easy to make mistakes and get burned, <clears throat> uh, just like programming in C. So you, you have to actually be more careful and really know the language, the, all the ways you can get burned on Verilog, whereas VHDL is pretty much if you code it, it's not going to have nearly as many possible uh, gotchas as Verilog would. So it's a, it's a, it, learn either one, but just be aware that, that if you're gonna go do Verilog, you have to be careful. You need to fix all the warnings that your tools give you and run your code through as many tools as you can to check it, just like in C, people use linters as a good design practice. Great. I think that's Anything uh, else? I think that's it. I think you can start your presentation. Oh, Fred, do you want to introduce Fred? I think he's offline. Okay, 